Hi, everybody. We're just going to give it another minute or so for people to, uh, to get in. Okay, and we're gonna get started here. Um, welcome everyone. My name is Adelina Iftene. I'm the Associate Director of the Health Law Institute at Dalhousie and the professor at the Schulich School of Law. And uh, I am pleased to welcome you to another seminar in our Health Law Institute speakers uh, series. Um, this year, the series is focused on justice, diversity and equity. And we have a fantastic speaker today that I'm very, very pleased um, uh, to introduce in a second. Um, until, uh, um, but before that, I do want uh, to, um, to mention a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, first of all, this seminar is recorded. Now the audience members are not going to be um, captured in the video, um, but you can access it uh, if you want to rewatch or share it on, uh, on Shulik School of Law YouTube channel. Um, secondly, we do have closed captioning at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you will see a button that says uh, closed captioning or uh, CC. Uh, please make sure you turn it on should you need or um, want to use the subtitles. Uh, and finally, the questions today will be, uh, can be posed through the Q&A function. And again, at the bottom of the screen, you're gonna see a Q&A tab feel free to use and ask questions uh, throughout the event. Um, at the end, after uh, Sharon uh, finishes uh, her talk, I'm gonna come back and fill the questions. Um, you will be able to see the questions that others ask and you'll be able to vote on them if you're interested in the answer. So that way they will jump at the top of my list and I'll be able to prioritize those, uh, those questions. Now, without any further ado, uh, I am going to introduce our speaker today. We are very pleased to welcome uh, Ms. Sharon Davis Murdoch. She is a social justice champion. Uh, she's retired from the Nova Scotia Public Service and Sharon's political science background and public policy experience inform her work in the community. Among her public policy accomplishments uh, was the development of the first provincial guidelines for culturally competent primary healthcare in Canada. Sharon received the Premier's Awards of Excellence in 20, 2007 and 2015. In 2018, Sharon received the Inspiration Award from the Dalhousie School of Public Administration, awarded to public servants who have demonstrated a superior dedication and commitment to mentoring, coaching, and inspiring students and public servants over the course of their careers. Sharon now works at the community level and is a founding member and the co-president of the Health Association of African Canadians. Additional to that role, she now serves as co-manager to the Association of Black Social Workers and Health Association of African Canadians, COVID-19 Response and Impact Team. She's also an advisor to the Halifax Immigrant Partnership and secretary of the Dartmouth General Hospital Foundation Board. Uh, now, uh, uh, Sharon is also the president of, uh, of uh, Shamar Dovan, uh, maybe, maybe the pronunciation is not quite correct, consulting. Uh, Sharon was appointed and served as a commissioner on the Independent Commission on Effective Electoral Representation of Acadian and African Nova Scotians. She was also a presenter and writer for the 2018 Women in Leadership Campaign School and is author of the Knowing Your Community uh, pamphlet for the Nova Scotia Advisory uh, Council on the Status of Women. In October 2020, Sharon was selected as one of the Black Women Leaders for the Black Women in Leadership sharing and shaping our journey online conference. Sharon is a proud member of the Dartmouth community and an even prouder Nana of two grandbaby boys. Um, we are very lucky to have uh, Ms. Davis Murdoch here uh, with us today. She will be talking about uh, um, matters of black health, resilience and determination. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it on to Sharon and uh, looking forward to the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Adelina. And certainly thank you to the Schulich Law, uh, School of 
Law and for those coordinators of this seminar series. I'm very, uh, I'm delighted to be here and I'm honored to have been asked to be here. Um, so we are going to move into uh, the presentation. Um, and, uh, but before that, I guess I will just say this, um, as you heard uh, from that kind introduction, um, I am a, a policy person. Uh, all my career, I've been involved in policy as, as policy analyst, senior policy analyst, policy advisor, and so on. And so um, policy tends to be uh, the way that I think and, and, and my framework for things. So um, today for this presentation, I thought I would take a multi-pronged approach. Um, which is kind of policy language. Um, and what I'd like to do, I'd like to accomplish three things in this. I'd like to tell a story um, and share a story with you. I would like to also leave a history of our health resistance in this province. Um, and I would also, uh, understanding that among the broad audience that is here are a number of law types, lawyers, and law professors. So thirdly, and perhaps maybe even most importantly, I'd like to build a case, a case for our policy determination. Um, so thank you for uh, allowing me to frame it. And uh, I uh, certainly would appreciate sharing the presentation now. Um, our HOC uh, administrative assistant is going to help me with that sharing the screen for the presentation. So here we have uh, the beginning of the presentation and uh, I think we can, we can move right to the second slide now. So I think it is, in fact, I know it is important to give you a sense of the Health Association of African Canadians uh, in terms of our founding members. It's really important to do that. And uh, our founding members um, include uh, former MLA uh, Yvonne Atwell, the one and only black female MLA in Nova Scotia history, still. Uh, also Sue Edmonds, who uh, is in, now lives in Quebec. She was a psychiatric nurse at the Nova Scotia Hospital. The late and, and wonderful Fran Harper, who was a nurse and a trailblazer at the IWK. And certainly Dr. Josephine Atawa, who uh, is an author of numerous um, books and articles on, uh, on health and race and those intersections. She was a professor of nursing at Dalhousie and is now a professor of nursing at the University of Ottawa. So those women and myself are the founding members of our Health Association of African Canadians. I'm pleased to, ask, to add as well that Rhonda Atwell, the, the daughter of, uh, of MLA, former MLA Yvonne Atwell is one of our uh, board directors, but she is also the first Nova Scotia Health, uh, African Nova Scotian Services Consultant. Um, and we also have among our membership, the daughter of our founding member, Fran Harper, and that is uh, public health nurse, Angela Harper. So it's wonderful that we have uh, among our membership and as part of our work, the daughters of two of our founding members. So all of us together have since the establishment of the Health Association of African Canadians, also known as HOC, our vision has always been thriving, healthy African Canadian communities in Nova Scotia. And our mission still is to promote and improve the health of African Canadians in Nova Scotia through community engagement, education, policy recommendations, partnerships, and research participation. 
So next slide, our history, our struggle, our health and our destiny. So when we think about the history of our people, we have to recognize that Africa's great civilizations were in existence long before the, the transatlantic slave uh, movement uh, across, across the Middle Passage and to wherever we ended up in the African diaspora. We were interrupted by 400 years of enslavement. Our people were then diminished by segregation, racism of all sorts. We are still punished with racism and discrimination, but indeed we've been resilient throughout. We are not defined by the past, but we have been hurt by it. And I'm gonna talk about that today. So we are determined to fight for justice. Dr. Joy DeGruy is the author of The Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome. She wrote that book, uh, it was published in 2005. And she says, the slave experience was one of continual violent attacks on the slave's body, mind, and spirit. Slave men, women, and children were traumatized throughout their lives and violent attacks during slavery persisted long after emancipation. In the face of these injuries, those traumatized adapted. They adapted their attitudes and behaviors to simply survive. And these adaptations continue and manifest today. So the syndrome examines, or the post-traumatic slave syndrome, examines these adaptations with an eye toward identifying those adaptations that limit us and those that make us stronger. But in her powerful words, DeGru asks or states, let's do the math, 339 years of trauma, no help, then you get freed. Did the trauma continue? I think we all understand that it certainly did. Next slide. So Dr. Joy DeGru explains that the syndrome is a condition that exists when a population has experienced multi-generational trauma resulting from centuries of slavery and continues to experience oppression and institutionalized racism today. Added to this is the belief, real or imagined, that the benefits of the society in which they live are not accessible to them. We bought, that is Hawk brought, Dr. DeGru to Nova Scotia for our mental health conference in 2015. And some of you may have attended and may remember that. So Dr. DeGru, next slide, talks about, talks about the painful exper experiments that were that were uh, done to our, uh, to our people. It's really important in these next slides, it, it's gonna be difficult for me to even um, talk about this, but it is important that we know our history. We must know our history so that we can learn from it, so that we can continue our determination for justice. The history informs what we need to do. And so in conveying uh, information about our history, I want to start by talking about uh, Dr. Marion Sims. He is credited for the invention of the vaginal speculum and repair of vaginal fistula. He is referred to as the father of gynecology. However, um, it is important that we know that Dr. Sims experimented on black women who were enslaved, performing surgical techniques without the use of anesthesia. 
women were considered the property of enslavers and they were not even permitted to give consent. Uh, I also want to say that every woman who is watching uh, this um, and listening to this is likely um, and very importantly, uh, a, a patient of, uh, of the healthcare system and as is necessary for health promotion and disease prevention on, on the receiving end as a patient of uh, pap tests. Pap tests are important um, and they are ways in which um, uh, certain kinds of cancers can be, um, can, be, can be seen early and early enough that it, it is a life-saving process. But gyneco uh, gynecology actually was, um, the practice was actually built on the bodies of black, of our black female ancestors uh, because the speculum was used in crude, um, crude pre-speculum uh, tools, if you want, uh, for, the want for the lack of a, a better word, were used on our women. And, you know, it was also the, the sense that we were so dehumanized through the enslavement process that there was this, this myth that black people and black women in this case didn't actually feel pain in the same way that other people did. And that myth continues, believe it or not. So when we look back at the history of enslavement, we know that women, uh, and we even have some of the names of, of some of these enslaved women, Lucy, Anarcha, and Betsy, were taken to Sims by enslavers who were focused on increasing the product production yields of our people. So chattel slavery dehumanized us and we were treated like animals. And uh, Dr. DeGruy covers this history extensively in her book. I wanna add that this information is available publicly um, from the History Channel and the Healthline websites. And this is where um, we have been able to, to glean this information today. Uh, next slide, please. So the pain of these enslaved women, the stories that of those terrible experiences that they had were not told in the ways that they would be today. They weren't even considered. But giving a voice to that kind of pain that came, maybe, maybe there were oral histories shared between the women. But uh, Dominique Christina, who is an award-winning educator, poet, and author, she is a cultural historian, she wanted to give voice to these women. And so she has written this poem, No Magic, No How. And it goes like this. Right there, right there, when Massa Doctor looked right past the way I heard to say she a tough old gal, she could take a mighty licking. That puts it uh, in context. The deepening roots of mistrust, indeed, apart from our women, our men were experimented on and treated as disposable. Well known to many of you is the Tuskegee study, 40 years of human experimentation in America. This experiment was conducted by the US Public Health Service over a 40 year period starting in 1932. It involved about 600 black men from Alabama who were between the ages of 25 and 60 and experiencing poverty. The study included 400 black men 
with untreated syphilis and around 200 who didn't have the disease to act as a control group. They were all told they were being treated for bad blood for six months. And again, the study involved painful spinal taps, x-rays, and blood tests. Next slide. So the Tuskegee uh, study continued. When participation waned, the researchers started providing transportation and hot meals, exploiting the poverty of these men. In 1947, penicillin was shown to be effective in the treatment of syphilis, but wasn't administered to the men in the, in the study. Instead, researchers studied the progression of the disease, allowing the men to become ill and die. In addition, the researchers ensured that the participants weren't treated by other parties. Now, this study only ended in 1972. I was in junior high school when it ended. And it ended because the Associated Press tipped off by Peter Buxton reported on it. The tragedy continued. Many men in the study died from syphilis and related illness, but it, they also affected women and children as the disease spread. An out of court settlement was given to men who survived and the families of those who died received a mere $10 million. Next slide. And I do wanna say that the following slides were produced by my colleague and former Hawk co-president, Dr. David Haas. Uh, many of you will have heard Dr. Haas's presentation about mistrust um, at our uh, HOC uh, COVID-19 town hall um, that we held uh, earlier this month on vaccine, uh, that is COVID-19 vaccines, fact versus fiction. So I do want to acknowledge that these slides were produced by Dr. Haas. Next slide. This is a New York Times article in, from 2016, which talks about this mistrust. 2016, this was. The mistrust from these experiments, these atrocities that continue to impact our thinking and our trust of the health system. Now, there are a number of these and, and there are more that I'm gonna tell you about, but, but certainly these are within uh, US uh, history and, and uh, there are not, or at least I don't have access to um, this kind of information from Canada, but understanding that the uh, transatlantic slave trade impacted all of us across the African diaspora and certainly uh, those of us in North America came from this kind of background and were impacted and still are impacted by these atrocities in the United States that inform us and unfortunately create mistrust in us about the health system. Another, another case, next slide, is about Henrietta Lacks, a woman who was reduced to cells. At the age of 31, this black woman was diagnosed with and died. Doctors preserved sample tissue from the tumor without her consent or the consent of her family. In fact, informed consent didn't even exist at that time. The cells considered immortal were used in over 70,000 medical studies and played a significant role in medical advances, including the treatment of cancer, in vitro fertilization, and vaccines for polio and HPV. In 2013, Lacks genome was sequenced and that was made available or made public to some people. This was done without her family's consent and constituted 
a privacy violation. The information about that violation was hidden from public view. The National Institutes of Health later came to an agreement with the Lacks family on the use of data. Next slide. And there she is, Henrietta Lacks, picture of this woman. Um, and indeed, uh, forced sterilization is another issue of atrocity that uh, has faced or that our people have endured. Um, Fanny, Lou, Fanny Lou Hamer was one of the people affected by this in 1961 when she went to a hospital in Mississippi, presumably to have a uterine tumor removed. At that time, the surgeon removed her uterus without her knowledge and Hamer only found out when the rumor spread across the plantation where she was a sharecropper. This kind of medical violation was intended to control the African-American population. It was such a common occurrence that it was dubbed the Mississippi appendectomy. Now, it might surprise you to know that there have been concerns raised by black women in this province about unnecessary hysterectomies, but thus become or begins the case that I would like to make about the fact that we do not have Canadian evidence of this. We don't have data about this. And so all I can tell you is that I have been in conversations with women who have talked about unnecessary hysterectomies right here in this province. Next slide, please. In 1966 in Chicago at a press conference before his speech at the second convention of the Medical Committee for Human Rights, our icon, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said in part, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. This of course would have been uh, at a time when the Tuskegee experiment was going on but hadn't even been made public. Things from, uh, from the time of enslavement through the kinds of, of uh, atrocities that were that he was aware of led him to make this statement. And it's a powerful one about health and the health system and black people's interaction with it. And indeed this informed his civil rights struggle and the movement and he said, I see all, no alternative to direct action and creative nonviolence to raise the conscience of the nation. Next slide, please. Now, in this picture, um, it's not terribly clear, but you will see that that is former President Ronald Reagan. And next to him is a woman by the name of Margaret Heckler. Um, and uh, this is important because um, I, would, I was surprised that it was under the Reagan administration that Secretary Heckler wrote the report on uh, black and minority health. So commonly known as the Heckler Report, um, this was the first time in the history of the US government where there was a comprehensive study of the health status of racial and ethnic minorities. And this elevated minority health onto a national stage. The Heckler Report concluded that health disparities accounted for 60,000 excess deaths each year and that six causes of death accounted for more than 80% of mortality among blacks and other minority populations. Next slide. The Heckler report was actually the impetus 
for the uh, for the establishment of the U.S. Office of Minority Health, which is a an aspect or a, um, an office of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and this Office of Minority Health was created in 1986. The mission of the office is to improve the health of racial and ethnic minority populations through the development of health policies and programs that will help eliminate health disparities. Now, I would really like to see the equivalent of the Office of Minority Health in Canada. We don't have an equivalent. We have offices, we have structures, but this office is essential to a movement toward health equity for people of African descent living in the United States. And it has tentacles across the African diaspora. Here in this, on this slide is a picture of uh, the current director of the US Office of Minority Health, LaShawn McIver. Next slide. Indeed, the priorities of the Office of Minority Health for this year, for 2020 and 2021, are as follows. Supporting states, territories, and tribes in identifying and sustaining health equity, that is the promotion of policies, programs, and practices. Expanding the utilization of community health workers to address health and social services needs within communities of color. And finally, strengthening cultural competence among health providers throughout the country. And I want to talk a bit about that. Cultural competence began uh, with the work of uh, Joseph Betancourt and Terry Cross in 1989. The, uh, the definition of cultural competence is a set of congruent behaviors, attitudes, and to my policy preference, policies that come together in a system agency or amongst professionals that enable them to work effectively in cross-cultural situations. The Nova Scotia user-friendly version is that cultural competence means having the attitudes, awareness, knowledge, skills, and policies to better meet the needs of the people that we serve. It is the context for Hawk work from the very beginning when Dr. Uh, Josephine Atawa, when Sue Ed, uh, Edmonds and Fran Harper and I and MLA Yvonne Atwell worked together. It was within this context. And I think that it is important to make this point today. Cultural competence is not about an end. It's not about getting, going to a, a cultural competence training session for an hour or two, getting the t-shirt and coming out saying you're culturally competent. That is not, that is not the uh, appropriate or, or accurate understanding of cultural competence. It never was. Cultural competence within healthcare comes out of the understanding of healthcare practice that competence is an ongoing life learn lifelong learning process. And so I often say that cultural competence is a journey, not a destination, but standing still is not an option. Today I'm adding that cultural competence is lifelong learning, always striving, but never arriving. Next slide. So you can see that indeed it is a process that begins with cultural sensitivity. That's the very bottom of it and moves from an individual and organizational and a system level through awareness, 
knowledge, skills, and ongoing competence, ongoing competence. Nobody gets there. It is a continuous movement toward learning and applying. And indeed, next slide, it is important to understand within this context that it is necessary for individuals, individual clinicians, for organizations such as, for example, the Nova Scotia Health Organization, the governors of the Nova Scotia Health System, that, and indeed for the system, the Nova Scotia Health System writ large, that in all of those areas, there is an understanding of our history that evolves. There is an understanding of our lived reality that evolves. There is an understanding of our clinical needs, the need for clinical cultural competence that will equip providers with an understanding that diseases and conditions look different, can look different, can behave differently in black bodies than in white bodies, than in indigenous bodies, than in, in Asian bodies, that there are diseases and conditions that need attention that will support our health so that that understanding, those clinical needs be developed on an ongoing basis to serve so that we are served. We inform the system and we are served by the system. And very importantly, cultural competence gets to the point that one size will never fit all. So indeed it is about having an understanding of our history, lived reality and our needs between black people and other populations, but also between populations of black people. Because what, what uh, diseases and conditions may look like in African Nova Scotians might be quite different than what they look like in people of African ancestry from other parts of the world. Sickle cell anemia, for example, is, is one which may show up differently from people who have immigrated to, uh, to Nova Scotia from Sub-Saharan Africa than, than other kinds of blood disorders that are more commonly seen in Nova Scotia. And of course, I say all of that because of the anecdote that has been passed on, not because we have the data and the evidence that I can prove. So having said that, before I move on from cultural competence, I just want to say that indeed, Cultural competence has a clear and comprehensive practice framework. It is still relevant and it is as relevant for professionals, organizations, and systems as the change we seek in each of those. Next slide, please. So we have been resistant to the kinds of, of atrocities, the kind of mistrust that we've dealt with with the health system over many years. And here um, are quotes from uh, two uh, black, uh, from black authors from, from two books. Uh, blacks in particular are stigmatized and discriminated against in a fashion that drastically undermines their social and economic status in Canada. And that was from Christensen and Weinfield, 1993. And indeed from Fraser in 2005, perceived as a threat to the white community, Nova Scotia blacks suffered more severe discrimination than other ethnic minority communities in Canada. And so, next slide, please. The Health Association of African Canadians was born in 2000. It is the only uh, solely health-focused African-Canadian organization in the province. Um, it was initiated uh, 
or it was it was established in 2000 and indeed we have initiated all existing black health programs in Nova Scotia and over 15 black health projects without operational funding we have remained relevant and resilient our advocacy is for Nova Scotia and Canadian governments to take health policy action to address anti-Black racism and health inequities. So I want to tell you just a few of the programs of which I'm speaking. We were uh, absolutely pivotal in the establishment of the Nova Scotia Brotherhood Initiative. And we uh, advocate, and we've been advocating since 2018 for the establishment of the primary health equivalent, a Nova Scotia Sisterhood Initiative. And this was most recently evidenced by the Safe Spaces in Race and Health Talks project, which you might have heard about and seen on on CBC television and heard about on the radio, in which we had hairstylists and barbers create the environment for talking about the intersection between race and health and understanding of racism as a social determinant of health. Hawk initiated that project, which was funded by the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage, and we involved Black health care providers and Black educators as facilitators, because in this process, we wanted to build capacity for the expansion of the Nova Scotia Brotherhood Initiative and for the establishment of the Nova Scotia Sisterhood Initiative. Indeed, other aspects or other programs that we have initiated include the matter of Black health, where you would, uh, many of you would have been familiar where we had black coaches uh, in place who were supporting the management of chronic disease. We were instrumental in the uh, plans group at Dow, which is promoting leadership in African Nova Scotian health and building uh, capacity among students, um, uh, black students at Dalhousie in the health professions we wanted to get more of them in, and we wanted to support them to success, and we still do. We have been uh, the initiators uh, in partnership with the Dartmouth General Hospital Foundation of the TD Bank Heart Health Project, which is taking place uh, as we speak. It is a project that is focused in the Preston Township. We are also Veronica, Marsman and I, as co-presidents, also the co-managers, as you heard in, the, in my uh, introduction, of the ABSW Hawk COVID-19 Response and Impact Team Initiative. So these are the programs and the initiatives that are still going. And of course, 15 other projects in, uh, where we, we uh, focused uh, work on the social determinants of health, where we wanted to uh, improve the lives of previously incarcerated uh, people in Nova Scotia. Many, many projects over the 20 years or almost, well, going on for 21 years since we've been established. Next slide. So indeed, this is uh, an example of our connection to the PLANS program. And uh, indeed, this picture was taken on May the 28th, 2017. And you will recognize some of the young, gifted, and Black, beautiful health professionals, um, among them physicians, nurses, social workers, other kinds of health professionals, all in this group. And we continue to build capacity support our health professionals, our students as they build careers in health. And we look forward to a different day when many of these will be in, these people will be in positions of leadership in health administration as well. Next slide. 
it is important also to, uh, to let you know that uh, Hawk brought Dr. David Williams to Nova Scotia in 2015. Dr. David Williams is a sociologist and chair of the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at Harvard. He developed the early discrimination scale, the most widely used measure of experiences of racism in daily life. He talked about that when he was here, and he certainly also talked about unconscious bias. He is the father of unconscious bias in healthcare. Next slide. And Dr. Williams, when he was here, he asked and answered uh, many questions. And, uh, and what, he, what he asked and answered particularly and what he has done in, uh, in, in the United States and throughout his career um, is to talk about what kinds of care and what kinds of inequities exist and still exist for our people. And he says, or he asks, what happens when blacks and other minorities get into healthcare contexts in the United States? Does their race or ethnicity make a difference in terms of the medical care they receive? The report of the IOM released in 2003 was called Unequal Treatment. And what it documented was that across virtually every class of medical procedure, from the most simple to the most complex, minorities receive poor quality care and less intensive care. And so when he was here, he was able to share knowledge with our, across the system and with communities as well. He talked to communities, he talked to clinicians, he talked to government. When I worked at the Department of Health and Wellness, we welcomed him uh, to speak to a group of, of uh, people there, policy people there, and he did. Um, and indeed, uh, he was um, so impressive and, and had such knowledge. And unfortunately, Again, in my effort to build this case, we have no Canadian data to substantiate the findings that he has for the United States. Something that we continue to work on. Deprioritizing sickle cell, the reality of research inequities. Indeed, sickle cell disease and cystic fibrosis are very similar diseases. Both are inherited, painful and shortened lifespan. But cystic fibrosis receives more research funding per patient. Sickle cell disease is more commonly diagnosed in black people and cystic fibrosis in white people. Sickle cell disease is a group of inherited blood disorders that causes the, blood, the red blood cells to sickle. And people with sickle cell are often stigmatized as drug seeking because the recommended treatment for their pain is associated with addiction. Now, as I have said, Hawk was established in 2000. Dr. Atawa had a constant, made constant effort to raise the importance of sickle cell screening in Nova Scotia. And that didn't take place at the IWK until 2014. To date, we have no numbers on the impact of sickle cell in Canada to prove what is well known to us anecdotally. Next slide. So inequities in pain management, we've talked about these myths about uh, black people feeling pain less intensely, ridiculous as that may sound, it is a, a widely held myth. And studies have suggested that sickle cell patients wait 25 to 50% longer to be seen in the emergency department, uh, that there is a dismissal of black pain, um, and indeed that uh, under treatment of black patients, pain has been connected to false beliefs. As I've said, in a 2016 study, half of a sample of 
222 white medical students said they believe that black people have thicker skin than white people. We do not have Canadian data and research to prove this in, uh, or, to, or to even demonstrate this, that these beliefs are held here in Nova Scotia or held here in Canada. But that is a reality from 2016 in the United States. Next slide. So we have ongoing inequity abroad and at home. As late as last year, a nurse reported that Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, I know you're familiar with, with, that, uh, with that terminology from the United States, that ICE was ordering unnecessary hysterectomies on women in a Georgia detention center as late as last year. At home, we know that our sister Lynn Jones has endured racist responses in a Halifax ER. This story has, has been documented in the Nova Scotia Advocate and I invite you to go and read the full account of her dreadful experience. Um, her honor man, Francis, had um, racist responses while she was, she was recovering from surgery at the Dartmouth General. Again, this, uh, this story uh, and this experience is available. You can read it in its entirety in the Nova Scotia Advocate online. But we also have, we also have anecdotal uh, evidence of other inequities, such as young black men being uh, disproportionately affected by mental health responses that criminalize them for being sick, that they end up being arrested when they are in the, uh, they are experiencing uh, traumatic uh, health crisis um, to do with mental health that black seniors were disproportionately affected by COVID-19, by the infection and indeed by deaths. We don't have data to support what we suspect here in Nova Scotia and it's time we did. Next slide. So when I've talked to you about the matters of black health, resilience and determination you can see through, through this presentation, the, the, the fact that throughout all of this trauma, we have been resilient, but we aren't, the struggle continues and we must fight for justice. Equity in medicine requires specific attention to marginalized groups, certainly including our people strict adherence to the informed consent requirement, implementing pro protocols, which is another language or another word for policy, implementing policy to counteract racism and unconscious bias, and developing more appropriate standards for funding research on the diseases that disproportionately affect our people. Everyone deserves care and no one should be sacrificed for it. So yes, we want medical advances, we need them, but we don't want to be harmed by them. And this, these are the words of Alicia Wallace, and Alicia Wallace is a women's rights uh, activist and author and educator from the Bahamas. And those are her words, and certainly we concur. Next slide. So we've mentioned to you about uh, the fact that, uh, or I've mentioned to you the fact that uh, my co-manager and my co-president and uh, Veronica Marsman and I are also uh, the, the co-managing the initiative around COVID-19, uh, the impact initiative. And uh, our work continues to support our people who have been hit so hard by COVID. This is uh, from a newsletter that hasn't yet been made public. So you kind of have a preview here, but we, our message includes the 
the fact that, that COVID has impacted our families, our jobs, our incomes, our way of life, our bodies and our minds, and our history and lived experience of anti-Black racism in all its forms have made it even harder for us to withstand the damage. But we have proven that by working together, we can get through these difficult times. It's that resilience that we have. We have demonstrated it from the grassroots up by making a way out of no way. And that is common to black people to find physical, mental, and spiritual strength. Next slide. So our determination is actioned as well. We have in hoc continued from the time of our establishment in 2000 to call on the Nova Scotia government and the Canadian government to collect data with diversity identifiers. Hawk is a member of the African Nova Scotian De Decade of People of African Descent Coalition, often uh, called DPAD. And in solidarity, we have advocated for the collection of this data. As is evident from the US and the Office of Minority Health Experience, addressing health inequities and disparities must begin with identifying the nature of these and the groups at risk by collecting information stratified by factors, including race, ethnicity, and language. And access and analysis of this data is essential for evidence-based decisions health promotion, research, prevention activities, and management of chronic disease, ultimately equitable health care. Very importantly, it must be done with us and not on us, with communities of African descent leading collection and governance of information by our people. Next slide. We absolutely need to facilitate, create, or sustain culturally competent, culturally specific, community-driven educational programs, resources, and approaches intended to target populations and, and to address the social and structural determinants of health, and that includes anti-Black racism. And we require accountability accountability from the health system in response to decades of recommendations, most recently synthesized in the yet to be public Nova Scotia Health, African Nova Scotian Health Strategy. Our sister uh, Rhonda Atwell will be presenting on this on February the 1st, um, that is that strategy, but it is yet to be public and we call on Nova Scotia Health to respond, to be accountable for the many, many well thought out, well laid out uh, recommendations we have made to provide care and service with a culturally specific orientation. Because we know that culturally relevant strategies are essential to meeting our needs, to fixing the health system so that it becomes more equitable for us. Next slide, please. So, to leave you, I certainly want to show and demonstrate that we, with resilience and determination, we did, we did it. We have women in positions of power and influence who have provided policy direction, policy information to Canada and certainly to the United States. Mikhail Jean, the former, uh, um, <laughs> the, I, I've just lost my language there, um, but uh, the Governor General of Canada, uh, to uh, her honor, Mayanne Francis, the former Lieutenant uh, Governor of, of Nova Scotia, to Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard from us and by us, these women have come. And ultimately, for the first time in the history of the United States, the Vice President of the United States, a 
black woman of South Asian descent. And she says, she shares that her mother had a saying, Kamala, you may be the first to do many things, but make sure you're not the last. And indeed that is our task at Hawk, your task as Nova Scotians to make sure that these women are not the last women to work toward health equity, to work toward all equity for our people. And with that, I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you so very much Sharon, for that extremely powerful and insightful presentation. Um, we have about, um, well, almost 10 minutes for questions. So, we, and we already have a few. I'm gonna start with a comment. We have um, uh, a comment from uh, Dr. Romy Shore Dryden. She's uh, uh, thanking you for the brilliant and insightful and inciting uh, lecture. And then we have also, uh, thank you, Robert. He posted the, uh, the links to the, to the two stories that were referred to by Sharon in her lecture in the Nova Scotia Advocate. Um, and then we have a number of questions. Uh, just a quick one here, somebody's asking, uh, um, where will Rhonda be presenting on February 1st? So that is online. Um, and uh, and our, I think if you go to our Hawk website, you will be able to find that. And, uh, and my, um, our Hawk administrative assistant can certainly send the link to, to you as well. It is a Zoom presentation. Yeah. It's not posted on our website. Okay. However, it is posted um, um, on the ANSA calendar online, the Office of Nova, African Nova Scotian Affairs event calendar online. All right, thank you so much. Okay, now I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through the questions. Um, so one of them um, starts by saying, those of us taking the seminar series course, which is attached to, to this um, uh, uh, talk series, uh, read an interesting article about white fragility and the limited tools whites uh, often have to recognize and talk about racism and the limited opportunities there can be to gain those tools through improved interaction. Bearing that in mind, what opportunities exist through uh, HAAC or other local groups to jointly engage in policy development around health and its social determinants, and importantly, to mingle informally? That's, that's a lot to unpack. So I think that um, initially there, absolutely, I, I am a, um, a support a supporter and a reader of that uh, white fragility book. I think it, it it provides tremendous insight and and I've spoken about it before in presentations. I urge people to read that book because I think it uh, you know it points out um, how the lived experience of of uh, of black people or people of color um, create in them a a, a conceptual framework about, about our lives and about, about equity that isn't easily shared by the white majority. But uh, so first of all, read the book. <laughs> I would recommend that. Second of all, what are opportunities for learning? Um, I think that's kind of what this, the second part of that question was. Um, opportunities include uh, you know the the Hawk Town Halls that that are open to everyone that we've talked about um, since COVID nineteen. Uh, we've talked about the uh, the importance of of um, culturally specific approaches to care, understanding the disease, understanding uh, vaccines, and so on. Those are those are ways in which um, people can be invited to learn and to share. Um, and, uh, and indeed, we are always having um, events, obviously, during the time of COVID, they tend to be online, um, but in fact, they're all online, I shouldn't say tend to be, but uh, there, there have been opportunities leading up to uh, COVID, and there will be opportunities 
please God, post COVID, um, where we will have those events where all people are welcome and, uh, and that sharing and learning can take place. I hope that helps to answer um, most of the question. I think so. And I think that goes also into um, a bit related to um, another question that asks if you are offering cultural competency training for healthcare professionals. So I think. Yes. Well, um, and indeed, I hope that Nova Scotia Health will move forward with that. <laughs> Um, you can you can be sure that we have suggested that, <laughs> um, and uh, and indeed yes, it it would it would make sense. Always though, with the proviso that no training makes somebody culturally competent, right? So uh, I just I, I I need to keep saying that it's about lifelong learning, but the training will give you an understanding and perhaps we'll, we'll provide you with a, with a framework to aim for. Um, and, uh, and really it's, it's so important that, uh, that people begin to see the, the importance of change at a system level and at an organizational level, as well as an individual clinician level, right? So, so that's, that is the, the attractiveness uh, for me and has been since I started working on cultural competence and, and my bio talks about that since, you know, since er the early 2000s is because of that policy component and that system reach. So anyway, in short, yes, Nova Scotia Health, please let's move forward <laughs> and do it, yeah. Um Thank you. We have time for one more question. Somebody's asking, um, why is there no acknowledgement of the need for monitoring in the system um, so professionals can be graded accordingly and therefore individuals who do not meet the required standards uh, be deemed unfit to work with minority communities? Well, that is absolutely, it's a fabulous question because there is a need for that kind of monitoring and evaluation. What get, doesn't get measured doesn't count, right? So we need to see improved practices, improved individual and system change um, over time. And it needs to be monitored. It needs to be evaluated. And you learn from that. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that, you know, for a provider who doesn't sort of get, you know, get a, an A plus on all levels that they should, they should stop trying. It's about when we know we have a benchmark of what we're achieving, then we need to, we need to then create opportunities, provide education and support to, to improve to improve practice. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna end here with a, with a comment that I think a lot of us can uh, echo the, the sentiment behind it. Celeste Gautel is saying that she had the privilege to work with Sharon Ronda and Senator Wanda Thomas Bernard, and they are very fortunate to have their knowledge and expertise leading us in this important work. Um, I think that's a, that's a great, uh, a note to end on and to thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise with us today. Um, thank you for the over 100 people who tuned in and, uh, um, and were interested in, in uh, this phenomenal work. And there is so much more to do, but uh, we really thank you for, uh, uh, for leading the way in this. Uh, thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Carla, for your assistance. And thank you, Amber, for uh, providing the live closed captioning. I thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. Thank you, everyone.